Welcome back to part two of our discussion with retired homicide detective Russell Oxford. In part one, we talked about all things homicide with Russell. We're going to continue on in that same theme and discuss some of Russell's high-profile cases and a few other things that uh, I think we might find uh, interesting. Russ, one of the things that, uh, and yeah, when I say prepare for a guest, I, I know your career because I, I, I watched you while you were uh, conducting your career. But one of the things that you did was study overseas. You won the Michael O'Brien Scholarship. Yeah, I, I did. I was very lucky. You having problems with having the headphones? Problem, earpiece, yeah, no. The, All right, you got it. coming back to me. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I was very, very lucky that I applied for a, an internal police scholarship uh, yeah. award and I travelled over to America to study homicide investigation. And I was lucky enough to work uh, with uh, LAPD, Los Angeles Police, um, NYPD, went to Washington, went to the FBI Academy, and it was a an eye-opener. An absolute eye opener. It talk was, talk um, us through it because I think uh, people would be fascinated about the different things that you see I, and learn in just, those environments. As I said, I suppose I, I came back with a great appreciation of how we do things here. Uh, we're certainly not not behind. Right. I, I think uh, the Americans are certainly chalk and cheese with Los Angeles. They're very smick with their their black uniforms and they've got shotguns in the car. They've got onboard computers and they're very. Regimented. The New York was a little bit different. Yeah. Um, working with the detectives, they simply just it was straight out of the show. The I think the NYPD blue show, yeah, where they had the yeah you know, get in an old beaten up old car with a walkie talkie and and that was it. Away they go. Uh, but it was it was remarkable. Uh, as I said, to go, I went along um, on a ride along with the the uniform guys in Los Angeles, and it was full on everything you went to. There was a gun pulled by the police. Right. Everything was at, at gunpoint. Yeah, and that was just the nature of it was. It was just um, your eyes are on stalks. You know, <laughs> I went to went to a couple of murders during the shift. Um, it's funny the uh, the supervisor who left me in the car. He said, "Just stay here." He said, "I'll be back," and I'm just sitting in the, in the dark. Yeah, and over there the rap music was rapping away, but the houses were shaking <laughs> with all this rap music, and I'm sitting in the car by myself. A shotgun to my left, onboard computer, the radio's crackling away, and all of a sudden the, the, the guy I was with, he disappeared for 15 minutes. Yeah. And he hadn't come back from a murder scene, and I thought, okay, I'll plucked up the courage to get out of the car. <laughs> so I stepped out of the car, and I'm wearing a vest, because that was one thing before you could go out, you had to sign an indemnity in case you got killed, it wasn't yeah. their fault. Yeah. So I had to sign this indemnity, I'm wearing my, my bullet-resistant vest, and I get out, and as I've stepped out of the car... I've been surrounded by all these kids have, have come out of the out of the woodwork and they've surrounded me. And they said, uh, you're a police officer. And I said, <laughs> no, nah, mate, no. Nah. He goes, yes, you are. We saw you get out of that police car. They've been watching me. Yeah. And all of a sudden, here I'm trying to walk into the scene. I'm surrounded by these young kids uh, who, who are starting to interrogate me about who I was and uh, what I was doing there. No, nah, mate, I said, uh, from Australia. They said, where? Where's that? I said, Australia. And they, they had no idea. I said, yeah. no idea. They thought I, then they said, Austria? I said, no, 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 Australia, mate, Australia, Crocodile Dundee, Australia. Uh, anyway, I man, managed to find my way into the scene and um, they, they processed that and then we went on to another another murder and uh, a man had been shot with a couple of different guns. And as we enter the street, you've got to imagine the, the, the patrol that I was working in had 35 cars working, 35 it's patrol cars. It's hard to comprehend, it? is. Isn't it? Yeah. Like you and I, when we worked uniform, uh, we would have, say, two or three cars yeah. would work the shift. Yeah. They had 35 cars working this night, and, and it's only a, a, about a nine-square-mile block uh, of what they had to face. So as I got into the street, we, we couldn't get into the street for cars. And they had helicopters buzzing around us. They had a couple of police helicopters and lights on, and it was just like a war zone. And I'll... I'm sitting in the car and, and uh, it's just pandemonium. You, you got the they call the SWAT team out and they're searching the house for the offender. So they're all kitted up and they're doing this systematic search. There's people everywhere, and I'm and he said, uh, just stay in the car. I said, yeah, mate, no problems at all, mate. So I just sat in the car and I'm sitting in my man business watching it all unfold. And all of a sudden, uh, two other officers come running over with this uh, young lady and they chucked her in the seat next to me in the back seat of the police car. So she's sitting there with me and. Uh, and they've hopped in the car and they've just driven out of the street. And I'm just sitting in the back seat. And they said, uh, introduce myself. G'day, mate, from Sydney, Australia. And then we've driven down into the street. And here's, uh, they've got the offender at gunpoint You're on the ground. Uh, the police have got him at, uh, handcuffed down at gunpoint. And they pick him up 
and they thrust his head into the to the uh, uh, the, the side passenger window where the lady was. And uh, she said, yeah, that's him, that's him, that's him. And that was that, her identification. That's their form of identification. I said, we just marched him up and just thrust his head into the glass. And yeah. she picked him out and said, yeah, that's him. And then we went back to the to the murder scene. They waited another two hours for it to get a warrant so they could enter the house to recover the gun. Yeah. And, and that's what I, I couldn't understand. They could do an identification like that, like that. And all of a sudden wait an hour and a half to actually go and get the murder weapon. But uh, as I said, and then we just kept moving on to other jobs and my were just on stalks. Yeah. I, mean, I just couldn't believe what was happening. Then they took me up in the in the police chopper uh, for a shift and um, you're taking off from the, from the, the rooftops and buzzing around. Would have uh, been a great Los experience. Angeles, it was, it was an absolute. And then to work with the Robbery Homicide Division. Yeah. Uh, and I worked, I worked in there and, and obviously they worked on all the uh, – at that stage, A.J. Simpson had just been arrested. So yeah. uh, all of a sudden, so I'm working with the detectives that were involved in that case. So they've taken me doing the tour of the, of the, uh, the A.J. Simpson tour and <laughs> yeah. actually saw him. He was actually playing tennis. He's on bail. Saw right. Him playing tennis in his mansion in the back of Malibu somewhere. <laughs> um yeah, but as I said, it was great to, You're doing to watch. great police sights of Hollywood there <laughs> in the <laughs> <laughs> But as I said, look, just just to watch, and they they gave me access to the material they they used and how they used to do their investigations, what we call our running sheets, so their computer systems yeah. were which we didn't have. So it picked up a, a lot of things from there, and then move it over to uh, to Washington was a, a totally different animal. The homicide squad worked twenty four hours a day; they work in shifts. Yeah, and one night they had seven murders in one night. So they just have like a rotating yeah, just, on just call. Rotate. It's yeah. seven murders overnight. Yeah, it's it, just continually on and on. And then, it's almost it's like a high volume crime for them. Oh, it is. And New York was was the same. New York was uh, was fascinating, fascinating yeah. to work with the detectives there and watching how, how they work. Talk and, us through that because I, I think it's embedded in our our psyche because we've watched so many police shows. You know, New York detectives. Oh well, even even to the point where. And I, w- I went to the homos- went to a homicide course over there, and that was part of the, my study tour was to yeah. actually uh, engage in the homicide course in New York because at that stage I was writing our course. So I went over to, to study to see what they had to offer and brought that back and, and put parts of it in, into our course. So you know, I sat, sat in on a homicide course for, for two weeks uh, with all these detectives from all around New York and FBI agents and others. It was a, a brilliant, brilliant course. Mm. And... Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, so the, yeah, so the um, just working with the with the detectives, and they're encouraged to get confessions out of people. You can tell lies to suspects. That's what I, I found fascinating. It, it changed the dynamics completely. You can make it with our uh, confession, uh, no threat, promise, or inducement. Over there, as my understanding, I'm not sure if it's been changed since, they can make an untrue representation. I can say that, hey, Russ, I know it was you because I got your fingerprints on the gun. Even if that's bullshit, and you go, oh, okay. I wouldn't have believed unless I saw it in my very own eyes. And that, that's how, how it plays that out. That's how it happened. Actual fact, that how good would that be? <laughs> oh. Well, actually, they, they actually sat me in a lot. They they arrested a man for an, for an armed robbery down the corner, and and he had wore a distinctive red baseball cap. And over there, they've got people sitting outside the police stations waiting to get called in to go into a lineup. They get paid money to go and sit yeah. on on a lineup. Yep. So yeah, the usual suspects are sitting outside. Yep. So they brought this bloke in uh, for, for a, a street robbery, and they sat him down, and they they actually sat me, <laughs> sat me on the ch- on the table with them. So I'm sitting in the lineup, yeah, with a red baseball cap on. I was the only Caucasian bloke uh, out of the out of the group. But at the, at the crucial moment, they pulled me out of the lineup. But here I'm sitting in in a police lineup, yeah, and they're about to interrogate uh, this bloke. And exactly what you said, right? They can. It's condoned. It's 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 expected that you do what you have to do. Yeah, to tell the people that to do it, and that's something I was, I was flabbergasted. It, it, do, it seems to fly. Well, it does fly in the uh, our principles of uh, law over here. So it would be uh, would be fascinating seeing it actually play out. I, I don't, you know, I joke when I say how good would that be. I don't really know if that's uh, the right way because no, I, uh, I don't think it is. I, I don't be, think because so. you, you could get a confession, it'd be getting a confession out of people that you couldn't even be satisfied. You've got the right person. They even did it. That's exactly right. Yeah, that yeah. And, and that's exactly. Look, I've had people confess to me that didn't do murders and. and have confessed and then all of a sudden you, the more questioning you've had them you realise that they haven't done this people don't understand that I've had that same thing occur and I think most uh, experienced homicide detectives would have uh, had that uh, and you've got to be cautious of it it's strange but people do make confessions to stuff and then then you, you're doing as much work to you know, disprove or, or prove 
what they were telling you was well, in fact That's correct. the beauty of when we go to crime scenes. We, we have holdback evidence. In other words, things that you see at your scene or little bits of, of evidence or little pieces of something very strategic in mm. your evidence, you don't release it when you do your media releases. You keep a lot of things quiet because only you and the killer know that it's there or yeah. it's been left behind or, or whatever. So that's why a lot of the times we don't release too much in the media yeah. as much as the media will ask us questions ad nauseum to try and get that little bit There's of extra. There's pieces of information you've that don't just go got out. To say, and often you hear, I don't wish to answer that or I, I can't say anything about that, which is frustrating for the media. Mm. But from our point of view, you've got oh, to have that whole big evidence. It's necessary. And certainly when you talk about the next case, when we talk about um, some murders down in Wollongong, yeah. there was very specific stuff that we kept back on that well, that was only known to the killer. Let, let's talk about that case because that is uh, it's and the uh, yeah a warning up front. The the type of detail we're talking about here is fairly fairly graphic. So if you uh, yeah might be upset by the uh, gruesome nature of this uh, these murders, um, yeah, just beware. So what uh, what year was it, Russ? It was 19... 19- I think it was 1997, uh, 1998. 97, 98. 98, yeah, yeah okay. because uh, I, was, uh, I was on call and my involvement was I get called down to Wollongong. Yep. Uh, the former Lord Mayor of Wollongong, a bloke called Frank R. Kell, um, a larger-than-life figure uh, when he was there. Uh, the, he's polarising, basically. The, a lot of the, the public either liked him or didn't like him. Essentially, so here he has been um, brutally murdered inside his house in in a well, I'm going down in a granny flat down the back of his house, and he'd been he'd been as I said, you can you get to some scenes when you see the brutality of a crime, gives you an indication that you're looking at some yeah you know, just some wanton violence for the sake of it, or or as, as I say, you can kill people and you can kill people. Yeah. You, you really go beyond the pale. This was horror movie stuff. This was. This yeah. was. So uh, he'd been severely beaten around the, around the head and he had uh, tie pins, uh, lapel tie pins had been stuck into his eyeballs and into his cheek, mm. which is, as I said, it's probably the last act is, yeah, take this, take this, take this by by the killer. So you're looking at a person who was, was uh, again, is it a revenge killing? So you you got to go into your victimology, work out the type of person that Frank. Now Frank had been charged with, with a number of child sex offences. So obviously we're looking at potentially a a victim. Yeah, uh, was being the killer. But uh, what we looked at was a, another murder that happened down in Wollongong two weeks earlier. Uh, a, a shopkeeper called David O'Hearn uh, ran a business down in Albion Park Rail. A uh, very quiet man. Um, he uh, he was horrendously mutilated in his house, and and uh, he he didn't turn up to work. And then the people that worked went and knocked on his front. As they opened his front door, they're confronted by the side of his body lying in the lounge room. His jeans have been pulled down to his knees. His um, genitals have been mutilated. He had severe cuts down the midline of his stomach and across uh, intestines had been scooped up and put onto a silver tray. Um, his hand had been severed and in actual fact there, there was satanic messages painted in the scene. Now, the, the, the in width, blood. Yeah, in blood. The width of the writing was the width of a wrist. So he's using yeah. his, his hand as a paintbrush, yeah. dipping into the poor man's body and painting Satan and, and satanic messages throughout the house and then severed his head and his head was in the sink, um, a confronting sight for anyone to see. Mm. So I suppose the, the difficulty that you've got there that any any police or any ambulance officers or anyone that's, that's attended that scene has got to live with that, but at the same time, it's just second nature that you've got to tell someone about it. Yeah. You've got to say, you're not going to believe what happened today. Yeah. Or you're going to talk to the media and all of a sudden it's out there that and they're depicting the, the satanic messages in the mm. scene and and the head there. But one thing that did come out of that was the way that he, he mutilated the body and, and cut intestines and put a certain length of intestine around the house. When I interviewed him later on, he said, yeah, I laid a meter of intestine there. I kept his head as a trophy. I did this. And only he knew because he was there. So I, I it, wanted, it become very, uh, yeah, when I did the interview with him, yeah, it was such cold um, and very calculating but the the uh, the kid that we we charged was. I, I want to talk. I want to talk about the interview. But can you talk us through? Because I think people would be interested in there's two crimes, similar area, 
brutal, but it's not. You you can't say it's exactly the same. Like one person was decapitated, you know, other person was, you know, the body was interfered with. When at what stage did those two murders get linked together? Well, in actual fact, we linked three. There was okay. another murder six months earlier up in Glebe. Yep. Uh, not far from where we are now. Um, a, a man had been um, released from jail. He was a convicted pedophile, been released from jail four days. And uh, when his body was found, he'd been mutilated. He'd been cut down the centre of his body. Genitals had been, been mutilated. Uh, a really, really severe beating. And uh, yeah, it was a horrendous centre of that. So uh, poli- the local police had... had had been involved in that with the Homicide Squad, to, but that went unsolved there for six months, and all of a sudden, David O'Hans popped up. Yeah, very, very similar types of injuries. Yeah, and wounds, and then Frank Arkell was two weeks beyond that. So simply, we we linked three murders together, but at the same time, we then opened up uh, into some historical murders, looking at either homosexual or pedophile murders as well. So we, what started off as a as Frank Arkell investigation, quickly launched into this major yeah. serial killing, potential serial killing investigation where where it's it's like the, the uh, I don't like the term, but the granny killing murders when they yeah. were on. You're on the clock and potentially- you, you're, you're worried about another victim. Another victim yeah. coming on. So you, you're under you're under the, under the pump yeah. uh, at the time. So you, you're trying to do your very best, trying to be proactive and put people out there to try and work out how they're all connected. Uh, do your victimology on on, on your, your victims to see what's caused this to happen. Are they somehow linked? Um, uh, eventually, the, the killer that, that did it actually returned to one of the crime scenes. When they did the, the door knock, the canvas, they'd mm. spoken to him in the canvas, but when the police were at the David O'Hearn crime scene, had it sealed off by tape, he's standing outside the tape yep. talking to the neighbours, what's going on, what happened, what happened? Is that uh, where his name first popped up? Did that? No, no, his actual name popped up in... During the David O'Hearn murder, yeah, it, you're right. During the David O'Hearn murder, they were looking at a couple of other potential suspects. Yeah. And this young bloke was interviewed as an alibi witness for the suspect at the time. Right. Okay. So they've interviewed him and he's provided a bit of background information on the other other suspected person. And again, we worked very hard. We worked independent of each other. But at the same time, we had every couple of days, we'd have meetings together and we'd go over each of the cases to see what were what were there. And we made a decision to, um, th- it was a tight record of interview that, that he'd done as a form of a statement. So we decided to put the record of interview to fingerprints because um, to see if we could identify some fingerprints on that document. But because what had happened is Whilst we're investigating that, and I, I did a couple of, of media releases. Because he, he, didn't, he didn't have a criminal history, didn't have a criminal so history. We, we didn't have access to his fingerprints. Yeah, that's right. So, so we, had, we had fingerprints at each of the scenes. So yeah. we, had, we had work there that we could work with, but it wasn't matched to anybody. So he, he wasn't known on the, on the criminal database, essentially. So uh, it was a matter of just waiting for that to fall into place. That somewhere down the track, someone would be arrested for some other crime and they'd link it by fingerprints. But... So we eventually worked this up, and and I did a a media release because one thing that on the Frank Arkell murder, he left behind some clothing, some bloody clothing, a pair of tracksuit pants, and some Colorado boots. Yeah, now very distinctive because as you walk into a scene, they stood out. Now, because that's another thing too, when you get into a scene where oh, that's a lone occupant of a house, you make the assumption that everything in that scene belongs there. So you've got no one to tell you what doesn't belong there and such. So yeah. certainly the Colorado boots and the tracksuit pants stood out. They were nine and a half, and Frank Arkell had size seven feet. So clearly they weren't his. They weren't. You could see the bloody shoe impressions throughout the house, and even on his body he'd been stomped on, and so his impressions were on his singlet. So um, yeah, clearly these were a very, bit of valuable, a bit of evidence we held, held back. But in the end, I, I did release them because certainly it was something the killer knew that we had them, but by holding on to them, we, we really needed them to be out there for anybody else to identify them. Yeah. And that's how it come about. Well, it makes sense in those situations. Like, he's not going to get an advantage. He knows that uh, he's left them there. And the other thing, too, that when we got to the, to the scene there with, with those, with, what does a person leave their bloodied boots behind and, and tracksuit pants? So, again, we're, we're continually talking about this case amongst each other and say, so why do they leave the boots behind? And in the end, we, we come up with a theory that, that perhaps um, he lived with somebody. Because if he walked into the house straight after that murder in bloodstained clothing, he'd have to account for themselves 
or if he lived alone, he could walk home and just go about his business. So in yeah. other words, this wasn't a loner. He li clearly lived with somebody. And it's those little interpretations or little breakthroughs that steer investigations on a path. And uh, I think people are interested in that, about that. Like it's needle in a haystack stuff, but it's those little interpretation. Okay, he's living with someone. That narrows the field down, the type of person. And the other thing too, that if he's, if he's left his pants behind, what has he left the scene? Is he semi-naked? Has he, has he stolen some clothing off a clothesline next door? Hmm. Um, has anyone had any prowl? Has anyone, has any taxi taxi drivers picked up any semi-naked men at yeah. a certain time of night? So again, you've got to think outside the square a bit. But they're the type of things that you, you, you focus your crime on. So we, we, we got, uh, I did a media release and we're inundated with calls. And we certainly followed down the, the Colorado boots because we're able to see a certain batch and brand number that, they, that was distinctive to a certain shop in the south coast of Wollongong. So we went there looking to see who purchased these boots, relying upon credit cards at the time because if they paid cash, we had no record. Mm. So we, I think we identified six people that, that had bought boots from there with a credit card. So we interviewed the six people and they, they still had the boots. Yeah. So we quickly eliminated them. It was a, it was a good line of inquiry, but it but, went to no. And that's typical of what you get in every type of murder you work on. You follow every rabbit down every hole and you get frustrated when it leads to nothing, but it's got to be done. It's got to exactly. be done. Exactly. I understand. And, uh, anyway, so we, we got to a point where a young lady come forward and said, um, I've got a, a, an ex-boyfriend. I went out with, and he used to have a pair of Colorado boots and, and these tracksuit pants. They're very distinctive. And she said, uh, "Okay, so this is the benefit of releasing them yeah, to the that's media." It. And this yeah. is so yeah. she's uh, she's rang in and said, oh, "Look, and another strange thing with my boyfriend, he had a fascination about these murders. He he kept the paper clippings, and he used to talk about it. And every time I'd ask him about the boots, he would make comments to me like, uh, no, I won't swear, but he would swear at her and basically said, don't say that again, or I'll cut your effing head off.'" And he mm. cut your head off. Pretty What's, specific. It's very specific. So we, we, we decided to look at this bloke. He had no criminal history. So we set about doing some surveillance on him. We kept him under 24 hours surveillance. And there was a time when he walked down the shops in Wollongong and he, he went into the hamburger shop and bought a hamburger and a, and a bottle of Coke. So our surveillance guys were, were pretty good on the spot as he discarded the Coke bottle. He chunked it in the bin. They've grabbed the Coke bottle, yep. brought it back, dusted it for prints, and up popped a print that matched the murder scene. Right, okay. And it also matched up to the record of interview that we sent away as well. So we're, so on that record of interview, we got fingerprints that matched mm. up to both the scenes, the Wollongong murders. Okay. But not the Glee one. So that's a dilemma. Yeah. So we're all set to start arresting this bloke. We, we marshal our troops ready to, to do it. And uh, by chance, by chance, I'm actually down at the homicide course in Goulburn uh, running that course. And so a couple of guys that are on the course are actually working on the task force with me. So we get a phone call at 9.30 at night. Russ, there's a bloke just walked into Wollongong Police Station. He wants to confess to a couple of murders. So I grabbed the guys out of the class and we just hit the road and drove to Wollongong because... Did that, they think it was just part of the course? You're just giving them <laughs> practical... <laughs> in actual fact, in actual fact, I gave it some thought to actually bringing the course with me because I needed all hands on deck down there because there was lots to do. Yeah. Because you're dealing with everything in doubles. Or, or potentially I was thinking triples. I was thinking three crime scenes that we need to go back, potentially three types of interviews to go back to each of the scenes, notifying all the relatives. So there's lots that you need to do that kick into gear. Plus you're on the clock. Yeah. You're on the clock because at that stage you had six hours, I think it was six hours to interview a person, or it could have been four. Yeah. And then you had to get consent to extend the time. And that started at 9.30 when they rang me up. Yeah, so time's, so time's running I need to get the wall gone really quick. Yeah. Which we did, and as I walked into the into the police station, he's he's in the charge room, and I said, uh, "Good day, mate. I've just arrived from here. I've just got a couple of things to do. I'll come down and have a chat to you." This guy remembered everything he he said uh, and everything he did. Yeah, you know, the amount of times that he struck him on the head, the, he did this and did that. It was just remarkable to sit there, sit across the table from him. And you did this on the nearest bend of on electronic interview on, on video yeah. tape, and and a couple of times I glanced across at Joe Casser. And we just shaking our head thinking, can you believe the, the level of detail this kid knows and the, the depravity of all to think that this is his first offence? Yeah. And all of a sudden he's killing all Did these Did he have people. a sense of evil about him? Like, um, not really, not yeah. really. Um, it was more the fact I just could not believe that a young young kid had such a, 
uh, just could just remember. My dermatologist was raving about pure retinol. It's an anti. <laughs> we <laughs> experiencing technical he, difficulties. Hearing noises. Are you hearing noises in your head? Because <laughs> I was. Apologies, guys. But, we uh, get that's pop-ups. all good. All good. Yep. So the the way that he was relaying it was very much a matter of, matter of fact. Oh, it, it was. It was, and. So I got to the point when uh, we'd interviewed and got all the all the uh, confessions off him. And then uh, one thing that you, you're taught when you um, investigate, that don't think that that don't um, essentially rely upon your confession on a tape that that's going to be the be all and end all. You always look for some type of, I suppose you call it insurance, but you look for something to support what you've got that's independent. Yeah. Um, so in other words, if the interview for some reason is is argued out at court. Yeah, he was tired at the time or, or, didn't or understand. something happened. Yeah. yeah, if you lose that, well, yeah. then you potentially lose a lot. Yeah. So the opportunity is you always ask them, "Are you prepared to come back and show us what you did at the scene?" Yeah. Of course, you're not obliged to do do so unless you wish. Is anything you do or say will be recorded? So you caution them; they don't have to do it. It's quite voluntary. Yeah. Uh, and essentially, this young man said, "Yeah, So he's he's um. When he was arrested, he was actually wearing bare feet. And, and the reason I, I mention that, because when we did to the David O'Hearn interview scene, we were very fortunate that both houses were still available for us to use, to yeah. go in. So we wired ourselves up with microphones and we uh, set about doing another interview just to clarify some issues. So not only did he give me the, the confession on a, on a videotape in a, in a in very a formal station. location, hmm. but now we're actually taking him into the murder scene where it's all there for and you're bringing the jury, you're bringing everybody, it's like to the scene. Yeah. And you're talking to uh, to this bloke. And as I walked him into uh, to the house, I had him his head covered over by a, a jacket because we had the media followings around. We are careful that we didn't want to get his face yeah. uh, photographed. And as I walked him into uh, into the house where Mr. Rahern had been uh, brutally murdered, they'd taken all the carpet up. So I left a little, little thumbtacks around the edge of the house. So he's walked in with a... With the hood on, as he's walked across, you could hear him say, "Oh, oh, oh, nails, nails!" And he's walked across the, the nails in bare feet. You do play hard, don't you, Russ? Well, I, well, actually, during the trial, it was put to me in, in the murder trial that I tortured him. Um, Did you do it deliberately? Yeah, de- deliberately left him in bare feet and left thumbtacks up through to do it. I, uh, I, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that walk through, and I got to say, it, it's quite chilling and I'm a seasoned homicide detective but watch him going through and describing what he did and why he did it and just it was like he's explaining how he made dinner it was and, it was weird and that, that's, how, how did you and Joe feel like walking through with him oh, it was surreal yeah. it really was surreal often I would glance across at Joe and we would just shake our head thinking can you believe it can you yeah. hear what this bloke saying it was just so matter of fact and cool about how he did things and then why did you do it uh I just wanted to know what it was like to kill somebody. Simple as that. But like putting the intestines on a tray and then washing. He yeah, washing I, I the, said, the, everything's a little bit symbolic. I yeah. ask him specific questions yeah, about, the Satan, about the Satan messages. Yeah. Why did you do that? And whether that was a throw off to, to stage it, it was somebody else that had done it. Like, you know, like remember Seth Gonzalez, he killed his, his parents and then yeah. uh, and write some, some um, messages on the wall. Is it a throw off yeah. in a crime scene at stage and you're looking for satanic serial killers, which or any satoba satanic killers, which yeah. we don't have a great depth of here. In America, they do, but certainly certainly not here. So, um, yeah, so as I said, you walk through, you're also using it as a, as a chance to um, get him to tell you certain things like the, the intestines and the tray and things like that that hasn't been released. It confirms that he said, I oh, did this, did this, did that, and it kind of, you tick the boxes, yeah, I got you. At the same time, you're also looking at what's he going to raise in his interview a la the Sid Morgan case I talked about before where he used his, his chance to be on video yeah. to essentially try and use it as a defence to get out to say that he was was somewhat insane. You always run the risk that you're taking this man back to this scene and and even when you look at the crime scene photographs and go there, you think no sane person, person. would do this. Yeah. Like I said before, you can kill people and you can kill people. This was beyond the pale. It was probably one of the most horrendous scenes you've ever seen. Mm. So you're also mindful of the fact of asking him the questions that you need to to prove your case, but at the same time looking to see if you can nail down some of his defences. Because I asked him a question about um, you wore some gloves into the scene. Yes, yeah, I did. 
Um, and why did you do that? So I wouldn't leave my fingerprints behind. Okay, so, so that's, that, that's a conscious decision from him. He's telling he knows us that what he's, he's conscious. He's, he's he's forensically conscious of what he's done. So that's not not an insane type of answer. Hmm. So little things like that. That as you interview the person, you I suppose you get to learn to try and look towards cutting off some of the defences, or at least trying to n- negate some things along the way. At the same time, trying to get uh, a confessional, trying to get this person to tell you. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, so it went on, and uh, and then from there we went to the Frank R. Kell house, and again that was another uh, horrendous murder. And and it's funny, funny how um, I, I was involved in a a um, like a, a crime show for for um, for TV. They did a like a not a mini series, but they did a a, a real life type of crime yeah, show. Yeah, and I made a commentary about the. Um, the hopelessness and and the uh, of what happened to put, for Frank Arkell, the the brutality of it all, and all of a sudden the amount of feedback and trolls that come on on the to the the podcast and saying Oxford Oxford's protecting pedophiles, uh, yeah. this man deserved it, and you, you just can't believe it. As I said, we, we certainly don't don't shy away from our victims as such. Mm. They're all all the same, and people often ask me, "What's the worst murder you worked on?" And I say all of them. Yeah, it's a, simply you get asked that a lot, don't you? And it's you, you, a very you, don't, hard... you don't pick and choose yeah. your victims, and you don't say, "Oh, look, he's he's a, a, a pedophile or whatever." Therefore, I won't do anything on it. You treat them the same because deep down, deep down, yeah, uh, there's someone's son or daughter or a relative, and it's not my job to to judge them. It's my job to find out who killed them. Yeah, and and that's what all I found when when I did that show after that that. The amount of people that that wanted to um, to write to me on, on and even on Facebook and um, and others, I had a couple of other cases where people have actually written me and, and even questioned my kids, yeah. my own kids, mind you, about um, what's your father? We don't believe he, he's a detective and uh, and he's investigating this case. Can't you see that these are the people who've done it? What's up with you, idiot, <laughs> idiot police? Yeah, you, what are you stalling on this thing? Yeah. Anyway, that's something you've got to do with. It's, it's, it's the new phenomenon now is is CCTV and social media are our go-to things in any investigation. That's something that, like you said, you asked before about do you learn is. and you continue to learn. Yeah. So today, from when we first started out doing the, the, the solid door knocking and the other stuff, it goes to a new level when you send people out to find a camera somewhere. Yeah. And, and it, it'll it'll add up. And, and when we talk about the Roger Rogerson case yeah. and Glenn McNamara case, that is the one of the most classic CCTV issues. So the, the technology has, has changed it, but still, you you still need that um, communication skills and that ability to talk to someone and get that information from people. Like, you, you need all the skills. We've got to upskill with the technology. Yeah. And I think um, analytical support. No, my pet hate in the. Um, years before I left the police, was that it wasn't recognised how important analytical support was on a uh, murder investigation. Gone were the days where you had one analyst and that analyst could cope with all the information coming in. On high-profile jobs, you need a team of analysts and otherwise you're going to miss stuff. The phone records, all the records, all the data Mm. that uh, you've got. So what what you've got to appreciate that, again, you can't be the smartest person in the room. You've got to... You're you're focused on on coordinating and running this job. You've got so many things to answer for, um, and also you need to put your faith and trust in some people that you are good rely at, on individuals' good at what expertise. Doing. Absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. You know, I, I always give a shout out to Bianca Commoner, uh, an analyst that uh, you know the quality know, Bianca, yeah. the quality of work that uh, she would turn out time and time again. Uh, I think she was the most important person on the strike force. You could take me away, you could take any of the other detectives away, but you need someone like that that can uh, process the sheer volume of information that comes in and, and analyse the information. And I really think we've got to get to that point in time with, with detectives like the homicide team. You know how we used to have the TIMS operator um, yeah. that would oversee it? We used to record the jobs in a book. We'd all have the red book and that was the job book and no one was allowed to take the job book off the boss's desk because that's where all the, the tasks were written in. We've changed, we're evolved, but uh, we need that analytical support to deal with all that uh, information that comes in. 
See, I'm a real old dinosaur. I still like that job book. That, that's how I, I cut my teeth doing doing on hey. typing on a, on a bit of paper, no computers, right. and I, I cut my teeth systematically reading every sheet that come in and numbering it in pencil, and and doing all what we call our running sheets, our records of how we kept all our murders and and writing this little job book was my bible. I, okay, com- confession confession time. I when uh, it, it came in and the, the the system changed and you don't need a job book now. I kept the job book. I think it was the Barbara uh, Saunders murder which was 2000 2001 when uh, it, the new system came in. And uh, I was I had Nigel Warren uh, on the strike force who embraces technology and he's he's going it's all right. You don't need the job book. I'm going. I'd look at him straight and you go, "Don't need the job book. You always need the job book." So I was running it concurrently, and it took me about a year or two to realise that, uh, oh, you can actually do, do away with it. You're not telling me you still ran the job book. I did. I did. And uh, <laughs> you another, are a dinosaur. Uh, there was another another very very sad murder I worked on in. Uh, it turned out on Christmas Eve. It was at. Um, we found a young boy's body in the Penrith car park, Penrith mm. railway station car park. He'd been abducted off the streets of Mount Druitt. And it happened just before Christmas. So you can imagine it was the worst thing that, that's happened. Yeah. This little boy's been found in, in the car park. So we converged on the on the Mount Druitt police station. And there was probably 10 or 15 homicide detectives there with the local detectives yeah. as well. So we had a major strike force and we were manning phones and the public was ringing in. The phones were ringing off the hook. Now at that stage, you've got to remember that I go back to the days of using a typed, what we call a running sheet, a typed record that goes into your tray. The boss, would you would pick it up out of the tray and read it, and then you would allocate jobs a job it. that come off it, and you write into your little job book and allocate it for somebody to follow up. It's simple. Yeah. Uh, when we uh, brought in this new system, what they call TIMS, yep. uh, it was a little floppy disk, and you'd put it in a computer, and you'd, you'd type up the information, save it, and then you put that disk in a plastic sleeve, you remember, in a yeah. plastic sleeve with a printout of the document. Yep. And then you put that in the tray. So what you'd have is a a computer disk with a bit of paper in a plastic sleeve. And on this particular job at, at um, that we had at Mount Druitt, uh, the system piled up where the tray was was a, about 12 yeah. foot high, literally foot high, and it fell off the desk. So everything just, fell, the computer disk just fell out of the envelopes oh. and they were scattered across the floor. Yeah, How do you match them up? To where they come from, well, and uh, yeah, we we it's um, prob- problematic. But I, I think that was problem. that was a funny thing on the uh, detectives course when you were running it, and when I was uh, lecturing on that or the detectives course. What's the most important thing when a homicide happens, and uh, they're confused? But we we need a whiteboard, and we need in trays. We need trays. We need to go to the stationery and get that because if you don't stay on top of it back then, um, as you said. Fell off the desk and well, well people that know me still I love a whiteboard and uh, <laughs> if I haven't got a whiteboard I'll get a piece of paper A four A three paper and I would write things at random and then I put a circle around them and all these little jobs are offshoot from it I'd have little arrows shooting off the circle and that's how I worked. There's but- there's some there's something to be said uh, I I'm with you on that like a whiteboard in the strike force room and having yeah your suspects up there or lines of inquiry details, that visual impact that it has, it helps because it does get complicated on homicide investigations and sometimes that visual impact that you can get by presenting on the whiteboard makes a difference. Make sure that everyone's on uh, on board and everyone understands what's going on. You're exactly right. We actually used- maybe, maybe that's why we're, we're retired now, Russ. <laughs> well, funny, we used to actually, I'm getting off, off track, but... Um, Part of the the uh, thing that we did at the homicide squad as well was work on serial rapists. Yeah, because it was always in the chart of the homicide squad. I, I, I wanted to speak to you about uh, one uh, yeah. uh, back in ninety seven, uh, Strike Force Ardmore. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, yeah, Task Force Ardmore it came about in a flurry of publicity. What had happened? Peter Rowan was a commissioner, and there was a series of very nasty sexual assaults on on women in the western suburbs, predominantly the western suburbs of Sydney, uh, around the Fairfield area. Um, a, a, bloke, a detective called Mick Weston was, was running the job out at Fairfield. And, and you've got to remember at the time that when when Mr Ryan was our commissioner, had come from, from England, he kind of had this mindset that you looked after your own patch. In other words, you yeah. looked after your patrol, but everything was renamed from police stations yeah, to uh, uh, local area commands and other things. So... You kind of lost a bit of focus on 
it should be just a to me it's just a police station. Yeah. It's it's Granville Police Station. Yeah. But anyway, um so they they were were essentially, I suppose, told to work within their own little little patch. So Mick's working very, very hard on, on this job and then there were other incidents that occurred in labouring areas, but they there was no communication between the two. But uh, what's happened, somehow um, I think some of the information made its way into the media and uh, and all of a sudden it was blurted out on 2GB uh, about this horrendous investigation because they, they'd actually, uh, a journalist had, uh, had fronted Mr Ryan, Peter Ryan, at the opening of a police station. Uh, Mr Commissioner, what can you tell me about the Western Suburbs Rapist? Mm. And he knew nothing about it. And of course he's horrified. So he's obviously come back and said, what's going on? I know nothing about this case. I've been buttonholed yeah. uh, about the Western Suburbs Rapist. And then they looked into it. And, and then the radio um, um, disc jockey got on there and talked about there's problems with this case. The, the police have done a very poor job. So then it, it's made its way to the Premier, down to the Police Minister. And, I, and that, no, that news... Um, hit the airwaves, of course. So I'm at home on a Sunday and um, had oblivious to anything of that. I'm at home on, on Sunday and I get a phone call from uh, my boss, Rod Harvey. And uh, you know Rod Harvey yeah, well, yeah. a black eyed admire tremendously. Great boss. Uh, yeah, and whenever Rod rings you up and said, or comes in the office and said, uh, hi, Ross, what are you doing? <laughs> you know that there's something coming. So he rings me up, he said, hi, Ross, what are you doing? And I said, I'm digging up concrete at home, mate, at the moment, boss. He goes, oh, listen, I want you to come in. He said, we've had a, a bit of a problem. Something's about to hit the airwaves tonight. We've had a series of, of sexual assaults that have, uh, um, that have happened and it's blown up. Essentially, they're, they're saying that the police have, have, um, have done such a shoddy job that this rapist is allowed to get away with yeah. it. So I've walked into a, uh, um, I was a detective sergeant at the time and Rod said, well, we're going to put together a task force and when actual fact, we're going to bump you up as an acting inspector. So... Hurriedly come in on the Sunday night and kick this job off. How it come about too was each of the there was twenty nine victims. It started off as twenty nine victims, and each of the the victims had a certain level of. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm again, I'm not trying to downplay the sexual assault, but this is the most abhorrent crime. It it is a kinder murder, yeah, honestly, yeah. and it should be treated with the utmost seriousness. Um, most definitely. So all of a sudden, these poor women have been violated by this. Uh, offender who would break into the house after midnight before 6 a.m. So you're starting to focus on what type of person would do this. So you go and you use your analyst, like, yeah. like Bianca and others, to try and work your way through and systematically work out of some proper criteria. And that's the thing that struck me, that there were common links to each of the crimes, whether it be through conversation or acts that he did at the scene, methods of entry, but certainly that between 12 and 6 in the night. Showing the pattern. Showed a pattern. So you're starting to think, how is it that each of these crimes, there were never any men in the house? How come he was never confronted by a man? How, what are the chances of, of, of uh, raping you know, potentially 29 women in the house and, and not coming across not a male? a man in the house. So yeah. has he been watching the people? Yeah. Does he know them? Uh, so as I said, you're, you're really trying your best to focus. To, and so we thought, well, potentially he possibly might be a shift worker. And he's committed these offences after knocking off an afternoon shift. So anyway, so how it come about was the the last victim, she received a phone call from a, a male with a bit of an accent. And I won't say exactly what they say, but he essentially trying to say to her, I would like to have sex with you. But he didn't use those words. Yeah. So he could use something more graphic. Yeah. And it was in broken. I want to have sex. I want to have sex with you. Yeah. Um, so she's a gas. She said, oh, it's the rapist. He's just rung me. The, the rapist has rung me. So that's we've managed to trace the call back to a to a factory complex, right? That operated afternoon shifts, and by chance it was there were three men working in the factory complex. There were two men of, of Asian appearance and a Caucasian man. Mm. From witnesses' description of our, our rapist, he was a Caucasian man. So yep. we thought, okay, well this bloke fits the bill. Starting. So we're starting to work on him, and. So we eventually start to work a man who had no criminal history and we start to to profile him and we do some covert um, things in, in as well as we're targeting this this person. Um, but what we later find out is that the lady's number 
was one a digit out from a brothel. So the caller that rang in right. thought he was ringing a brothel and was saying to the to the ladies there, this is what I hope to do to you. Yeah. And she's panicked. So it wasn't the rapist that rang back. But yeah. So it led us down a path where we focused on this place. Again, a line that you had to explore. Had to do. And yeah. um, yeah, as I said, it, um, yeah, it, it's distracting, but we did follow this, this boat down. Because whilst we're working this, it got such a publicity that the police minister got on, uh, the late Paul Whelan, uh, got on on the news at night and um, uh, that the thought was that the police have bungled this investigation and he made the comment, I will sack them all. Heads will roll. Trust me, yeah. these police are going to be sacked. So all of a sudden, I'm thrust into this investigation where it's turning turning to shit in front of my eyes and all of a sudden, I'm now the figurehead for it. Yeah. So I go into the into that night. We start up a start up at uh, the task force, and we work start focusing on that bloke in the factory, and then we we look towards collating all the information t- together. So I'm trotted down in front of the media the next day, Monday morning, and I'm trotting out there, and I get up and stand up and 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 try to tell the public that. Uh, looked because they're saying, what about this bungalow? What are you going to do about all the bungles? Yeah. And, and I said, look, we've got a, a team that's reviewing that part of the investigation. That's separate to what we're it trying to It's my job to, to catch yeah. this bloke. And I can tell you now from today, we're looking at, at doing this. In actual fact, I'm now going to release another picture, another image. So they did it, whether well, a confit or, a, or yeah. a sketch artist did another picture. So I've held it up and I've done my media release and, and really I was just inundated with 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 questions about the, the inadequacy of the investigation. I'm yeah. trying to say, let's just move on from that and we'll, we'll move on to getting, oh, I'm here to catch this bloke and we will. Yeah. So you, you couldn't believe my eyes. So Tuesday morning, I'm sitting in, in the task force room and uh, two blokes from Internal Affairs walk in. And oh, I knew the inspector. Yeah. And he goes, uh, how you going, Russ? I said, you're good, mate. He said, um, it's a little bit delicate. He said, um, We've just received a, a complaint that's come in through the minister's office uh, where they, they say that the detective that was doing the stand-up is actually the rapist. He looks like the picture. <laughs> and therefore, what better way to get away with it than to investigate yourself? I knew it, Russ, and that's what brought us to this podcast. I'm going to get you to confess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was, I was taking a little bit yeah. offline. Yeah. To, to, I had to they'd provide alibis for myself at the time of each of the rapes. And it's just... It's you laugh about it now, oh, yeah. but at the time, uh, to think that I've been accused of being a, a, a sexual predator. You're um, always too nice. Russ. I know, Never I know. Trusted but, anyway, you. but anyway, it uh, it led me led me to. Um, but th- these are the type of distractions, like the high profile investigations. These are the ridiculous types of distractions you can get caught up with. So, so, yeah, the, I I one hundred percent. From your point of view, where you said it, because I've had others uh, investigations where I've, I've taken over stuff or inherited things, and you've got to say, okay, that can be dealt with, but let us concentrate on stepping forward and going the right way now. And even even at this point, this offender would would defecate in, in a crime scene. In other words, yeah, yeah. Um, and as I said, so you, you're trying to say, well, do you collect that exhibit? Can you get some DNA from that? And um, as I said, we left no stone unturned yeah. trying to find this person. But anyway, um, I get invited in by the commissioner's chief of staff. Uh, Peter Rowan was a commissioner. I get invited in. Uh, the commissioner wants to see you, wants mm. to see how the investigation's going. It's simply just going to be a fireside chat. Yep. So don't worry. Come, uh, come in at 8 o'clock in the morning. So, I'll go, yeah, they ring me in the afternoon the night before. Yeah. So I've gone home and I've sat down and I've studied this thing to death and I've worked out exactly what, I'm about to meet the commissioner yeah. Yeah. to give him a briefing. So I prepare notes, I prepare a map with all, or plotting where all the offences have occurred and, and all the strategies we're, we're adopting. And, and the meeting was at 8 o'clock in the morning at police headquarters. I get there at 6 in the morning. I'm there when the coffee shop opens downstairs and I'm drinking coffee and writing questions out and potential questions and answers. I'm two hours ahead of time. Yeah. So I finally get in to meet the commissioner and I show him the map and, and go through it all. And and even I'm, I'm getting phone calls from the guys because at that stage they'd call in the, the guy that worked in the factory. They yeah, decided yeah. To, to bring him in and interview him. Uh, at the same time, fingerprints have, have got a breakthrough. We've identified a fingerprint at two of the scenes. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't the bloke in the factory, so we quickly dusted him off. Were they linked, the fingerprint? Was it the yeah, same they were, person? Yeah, linked, yeah, linked to scene okay, to scene. So great. now we've got yep. a breakthrough. We've identified the person has done it. So here I'm telling the commissioner, I'm looking at my map on the wall saying, well, we've got 
one here, one here, one here. I said, we're looking at this man here. Uh, it's been a several weeks since an offence occurred. But I said, we've got some strategy in place because um, if, if it turns to shit, I thought, mm. I've just said shit to the commissioner. Um, anyway, so I, I get the, fa- the, the phone call to say that we've identified the bloke. So I've left the commissioner's office and we've gone out and, and sought about arresting this, this man. So it was a bit of a manhunt to uh, to find him. We eventually arrest him in a house at, uh, at Wetherill Park and we find a treasure trove of material in his house. And this bloke was just a petty thief. Mm. And it was the work of the analysts on this particular job that gave us the insight that that gave us the indication of, of how come the men weren't in the house. Yeah, Simply what, simply what it was was he would break into the house and by chance break in at night and he'd look around the house and if there's any males in the house, he would just clearly leave. He'd take what he had to take. And early, he took cigarette lighters. He took petty items. Right. So but, but, but opportunistic it, if yeah, you break into a that's house. That's right. So he'd go into the house yeah. and take the handbag out in the backyard and rat through the handbag yeah. and leave the handbag behind, but take some valuables. And if the woman was in the house by himself, he'd re enter the crime scene a second time. Right. And that got our analyst plotted it out and worked out that this man goes into the scene at least twice. And that's how he could work out that where there's only women that he would do things yeah. to. And it was a um, yeah, it was a remarkable thing. So we end up charging with 150 charges yeah. of, of uh, sexual assault and and housebreaking. And we found uh, just a, a Aladdin's cave of little trinkets mm. uh, with the little initials on it and, and things. We, we had this the, the, we had this the, massive p- job to actually trot the witnesses in to identify all their property. It was just one of them for weeks. Where you, did they keep a little trophy from they the did. crime? He did. Yeah. That's what he did. He was just a petty thief and yeah. rapist. They're, they're creepy people, aren't they? Because oh. there was that time in homicide where we were homicide and serial violent crime, so we were doing a lot of serial rapists and yeah. uh, and that. And they're, they're so proactive, aren't they? They're driven to- and, uh, Yeah, that's that's what what strikes me is is firstly, how can a, a man do that to yeah. a, a woman? I, I can't understand. And it's it's all power. It's all yeah. a matter of, yeah. of having dominance over. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And it's not for the for the sex, no. As such, and, and I hate to use that crude term, but it's not for that. It's more dominating power over people. It's, and it's the most it. horrendous thing. Yeah. And and I worked on another one after that. Not long after that, I had another one. I worked on it at West Mead, around Parramatta. Yeah. And you mentioned the whiteboard, and, and on this particular occasion, we were a little bit um, scant on evidence, the physical evidence to to link anybody to to a scene. But we locked onto a, on a suspect. And what he would used to do was he would pick an area around Westmead where they had nurses and, and universities and that, so a, a target-rich environment as such. And what he would do would break, say, the quarter window of a car and wait for the person to get off the train. If it was a woman, he'd sit in the shadows and wait, and all of a sudden he'd be the good Samaritan would step out to help the that's, lady with a broken window or a flat tyre. Creepy planning. Yeah, and then into drag it. them into, into a house and, mm-hmm. and, and, and rape these poor uh, women and I, I had the unfortunate thing of having to take the whip, some of the girls back to the crime scenes to show me and and I said the hair stood on the back of my neck and it was just the most eerie thing I've ever had to do to, to have these ladies relive what happened. Mm. It was horrendous but I had to do it but um, it was horrendous. So, you know, we, we, we spotted, we locked onto this bloke at night and what he did, we saw him break a window of a car and then he was sitting in the dark next to a fence reading a, a pornographic magazine so we thought right we'll yeah, well, we we can't sit and wait for somebody to come out, so we've we've grabbed him. Now, at that stage, we our evidence was was a bit thin, and I remember I said to the detectives at the time, I said, uh, "Everybody get dressed as we are as detectives, yeah. and wear uh, your suits and ties." And as we walked this bloke in, we we strategically put some photographs around the wall and had his name on some boxes and other stuff. So, mm. as he's walked into the room, he spotted all these props around. I thought. Yeah. Without saying a word, the first thing he noticed was what's all the suits, and he could see he was, he was on the back foot straight away. Yeah, and uh, and it kind of we weren't lying to the man. We weren't doing anything. No threat, or promise or in, in no, 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 we said we just using. Uh, he had to be uh, a little bit cunning about how we did it, and yeah. eventually we uh, we identified him through voice identification, and part of the the script that they had to read out. To to the the witnesses as they come in and listen to the tape was yeah. what's all the suits so that yeah. comment he made to us we actually use that and and one of our victims identified his voice from that comment mm. so yeah so it's 
they're a difficult job to work on, serial they're, rapist. And as I said, it's uh, it's like any murder thing. You've got to be so methodical about how you do it. And and they are because we, we probably have more experience with um, serial rapists than we do with serial murders in this country. But um, the pressure's on because it's such a horrific crime. Oh, and, uh, you know, if you don't... Uh, pull this person in, um, other people are going to be uh, victims of his. Yeah. Another point that you mentioned there, like the, the turning up in the suit, and I know that from uh, homicide detect- detectives, but uh, I think there's, it carries some weight to the way that uh, people present themselves as detectives, looking prof- looking professional and taking pride in their work and, and that type of thing. We're not allowed no threat, promise or inducement, but you don't want a professional group of people coming after you if you're a criminal. Well, you know me. You know that, yeah. that I'm, I'm a stickler for, for that. And I, I, ad nauseum, I will lecture to detectives' courses. And if you want to be a detective, you look like a detective. And that's yeah. how you present yourself. And that's, there is that, that, that air of authority about you when you walk into a, to a, a, you know, when they walk into a police station, all of a sudden you're dressed like this. You're there. Yeah. You're switched on. You're prepared to, to, you're now hit first grade, basically. Yeah. And all of a sudden, as you walk in, into the room, and you've got people that are skilled, and and you you know you're brief, and you you're methodical about what you do. Of course, and that's of course it's I, I I like to uh, watch the way people prepare before they do interviews, detectives, and it's the ones that get nervous because they're over preparing are the ones that uh, I like to uh, unleash in the interview room because they know more about the offender than the, or well, the suspect than the suspect knows about themselves. Well, as I said, I used to bang on about um, uh, even detectives working on, after, you know, on on weekends, you know, coming into work with a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. Yeah. Look, you just never know when you're on national TV. Yeah. And can you imagine, can you imagine over in Western Australia, if the detectives over there were in a, in a pair of jeans and a, and a T-shirt? Yeah. At a scene, how how unprofessional that, does that they look, look? They look professional. That's oh, what I, I, I was watching. I was so I'm, impressed. I was so impressed with the way that they yeah. went about and how they spoke. Yeah. Um, as I said, all power to them. They, and put strategies pretty. in place. Use the media at the right time. Jumped in with that million dollar reward. That's uh, in, in actual fact. I've come to jobs where I've sent police home to get changed. <laughs> I know that sounds, yeah. strange, but that's just how I am. I've turned up at a scene when the detectives have, have worn jeans and a t shirt yeah. and. I let them continue, you know, complete the shift, and then I said, "Go home." Yeah. And when you come back, you're dressed like if you're going to work with me and our homicide team, you come dressed as. You a, know what a, that, that I, look that that's a cosmetic thing, but it's but it strikes pride in. Of course it does. What you're doing, does. so that that's I I get it. Russ, I reckon that we can talk for uh, another couple of hours about this. I've, I haven't even got through all your jobs, and you got some uh, some great jobs. So I'm going to um. Change tact a little bit here. So we're going to conclude part two of uh, I Catch Killers um, with uh, our guest, recently retired homicide detective Russell Oxford. Normally I say goodbye at this stage, but we've got uh, too much to talk about. So I'm going to put it to you. I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to come back for uh, part three. You're in good company. A uh, good mate of ours, Nick Callos, did uh, did three parts. I think the only one that's done four parts is uh, Bernie Matthews, but he escaped from prison and uh, a few few other other things. So, um, Russell Oxford, do you agree to come back for part three? Yes, I do. Excellent. Uh, I must warn you, everything you say or do will be recorded. Do you understand that? That's rich coming from you, Jibs. <laughs> oh, Jesus, Russ. <laughs> well, at least yes, I, I, I understand. I at understand. least I learnt something on the uh, on the homicide course. Um, in part three, we're going to talk about uh, all sorts of things, and uh, I really want to take a deep dive into the uh, Roger Rogerson case because I think uh, people are interested about that. But uh, you've got some uh, fascinating cases. Also, want to talk about. Um, when you went over to Beirut and your experiences in Beirut, uh, Strike Force, uh, that was Strike Force Gain? Task Force Gain. Task Force oh, Gain. Geez, as I said, you could write a whole chapter of a book. That was yeah. three years of my life. We yeah. worked on a series of murders and shootings in southwest of Sydney. And given given how busy you have been through your career, and uh, you made the point that was probably the most busy three years you've had. So that's what uh, we've got to look forward to for uh, part three of Russell Oxford on iCatch Killers. <laughs>